Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We're glad to see the members and the visitors. God's given us an auspicious day in which to meet and worship in his house. And I'm glad you're here. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in the Northside Baptist Church Hour is coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. I hope you're doing that. We're coming up. We can be a blessing to everyone. By the way, this is tape number 252. Tape number 252. If you'd like to have it, write in and send a gift of $3 for the tape and request it. I'm speaking on this subject, what is your excuse? You can call for the tape by title or the message rather, or the tape by title or by number 252. I have a list of 250 tapes. I'll gladly send you this list and you can select the ones that you prefer and write in for them. And I hope that you'll pray for us and Right to us. I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 14 and then Romans chapter 1. Luke chapter 14 and Romans chapter 1. While you're turning there, I want to quote something from a great preacher, Dr. Vance Havner, who went on to be with the Lord some few months ago. Dr. Havner wrote many, many great books and many great wise sayings. And I want to quote him on the word synthetic. You know, we're living in a day of synthetics. You know that. And I want to quote him on what he said and give a paragraph here. And this is, and I quote, It is a great day for country music. Some of it is authentic, but we bemoan the phonies. The drugstore cowboys has been around for years, but now there are hillbillies from Long Island, Mountaineers from Milwaukee, Appalachians from Amelio, and uh, Blue and Blue Ridge Banjers from the Bronx. They never saw Grandfather Mounting or Maggie Valley. And when they try, let me sleep in your barn tonight, mister. We want to weep. If you ain't been there, you can't fake it, end quote. I thought that was very good how that we have people today trying to sing songs about things they know nothing about. Some of the city slickers come out and try to sing about the mountains and the valleys and so forth and know nothing about it. And we have much of our country music today really in a foul shape because that doesn't have the message. It's so suggestive and so many, many cuss words and things in it until it's pathetic. You still have a lot of good country music. I wish to goodness that uh, disc jockeys would play the good country music that carries messages and uh, uh, they will lift you up and help you think about the good old days. There's much like that today that can be played instead of some of these suggestive songs and the hells and the dams and all of that comes out in these songs, which is seemingly out of the gutter. And we have too much good country music that can be a blessing other than have to use some of that trash that's being used today by many so-called country singers. I just wanted to uh, give you that quotation because there's such great truth in it and speak about synthetics. Now, in Luke chapter 14, I want to read some scripture. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 16. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it, I pray thee have me excuse. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, I go to prove them, I pray have me excuse. Another said, I married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now if you notice these people here putting up excuses, 
And then we come to Romans chapter 1. Looking at verses 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even as eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Speaking on the subject. What is your excuse? Now you out in the radio listening audience today. If you are not saved. I want you to listen very closely to what I have to say. Because this can help you. I mean it can really answer some of your questions. Because we run into these everywhere we go and you that are saved I want you to listen to these answers and that will help you in dealing with people that don't know God because when you begin to talk with someone about their soul immediately they're going to give you an answer or an excuse as to why they are not saved or why they won't accept Christ you'll have that answer coming up they'll have that excuse whether it's genuine or not, they're coming up with some kind of answer. And so I want to bring up these answers today to help you from the Word of God. Number one is that you feel you're too great a sinner. Have you run into someone that felt like they were too great a sinner that ought to be saved? You know, excuses started back with Adam, the very first man that God created and placed in the garden. Excuses started with him. And then his wife made an excuse and so forth. And so it started back there. Excuses are as old as the hills. And immediately people put up an excuse when you talk to them about their soul. And someone will say, you know, I feel like I'm too great a sinner. Now what does God say about that? We find in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 8. Come now let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now when you think you're too great a sinner for God to save you, is it you feel you're good enough without, with a good moral life to get to heaven without being saved? Now you'd be surprised today at the people in the world that live good, clean, moral lives they don't go out and drink and gamble and live in sin and steal and rob and live like the devil. They live good, clean lives. There's a lot of good mothers today that live good, clean, wholesome lives that are not saved. Good morality will not get a person to heaven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I use this illustration because it came out of my own family many years ago. My grandmother on my father's side was a good moral woman, lived a good clean life. For as I know, I never heard a curse and oath in her life. I never knew of her drinking any whiskey. I never knew of her going to a, a dance or a moving picture show or even to a ball game or any place where there might be a lot of sin carried on. She was good to her husband. She loved her husband dearly and thought he was the greatest man on the face of the earth. She loved her children and thought they were very precious, although they were all sinners like the rest of us, born in sin and living in sin. But she thought they were great. One of her sons accepted Christ over in South Carolina, and he became very burdened for his mother. And he came back home. He said, Mama, I got saved. I want you to get saved. She said, Son, how dare you to talk to your mother like that? You know I've lived a good, clean life. I've been good to your daddy. I've been good to you children. Don't you talk to me like that? He said, Mama, you don't understand. You can live a good, clean life and still die without God. You need to get saved. You need to be born again. She said, son, how dare you to talk to your mother like that? You know I've lived a good life ever since I, you've known me. You know that. And I dare you to talk to me like that. But he said, mama, you don't understand. He began to pray. But to make a long story short, later on, 
His mother come to know God. She is truly born again and became a, a Christian. And when I was converted yonder in South Carolina, at the very hour that I was converted, she was down on her knees out here around a, a, a community out here where she lived between here and Danielsville, down on her knees praying for me because she heard that I had been afflicted and she was concerned about me. And we checked on the time and the hour. And the very hour that I returned to Christ, she was down there praying for me. My own mother had her arm around my neck over there in South Carolina. Tears flowing down her cheeks. The preacher had me by the hand asking me if I didn't think it was about time that I got right with God. God moved on the scene. But she was not saved, although her hair was white as snow, until late in life. But every time that, of course, the children came around, she'd talk to them about doing what was right. Whether they did or not, she talked to them anyway. I preached her funeral when she left this world. Now you can live a good, clean, moral life and die and go as straight to hell as a Martin to its going. Now, living a good life will not get anybody to heaven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 14 and verse 3, they're all going aside. They all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So you can live a life as clean as a hound's tooth and die without God. You need to realize that. Then your question may be this. Is it you feel you have sufficient works to get you in? You'd be surprised at the people today that's depending upon what they do. Their good works, their good deeds to get them to heaven. I use this as an illustration. Uh, pardon me if you've heard it, but I was in the hospital many years ago. And a woman passed away, and the children were really weeping because of the loss of their mother. This nurse came to me, and she had been in the religious world from a child. She was up in, I guess, 75, 80 years old, been working at the hospital, employed there, been in religion for years. And she goes in, she wanted me to come in and comfort these people. She could, couldn't do anything with them. And she asked me, knowing I was a minister, if I would help out. I said, yes, I'd be glad to help out. I stepped in the room there to try to comfort those bereaved children. And she butted in before I could say anything. And she said, now listen, children, you don't have to worry about your mother. I am sure she's done enough good works to get her to heaven. And that's all she knew. Now that she had been doing good works in the hospital... I don't know, for many, many years, been in this religion, no doubt from a child, and thought she's go going to heaven because of her good works in the hospital. If that woman hadn't got saved, she's probably dead now because this has been many years ago. If she didn't get saved, she went straight to hell when she died, according to the Bible, although she spent many, many years working in that hospital. You are not saved by good works. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's not one thing you can do in the way of good works, or human efforts, or good deeds that will get you to heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 89, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved not of works, lest any man should boast. If working could get us saved, then we'd brag about how better saved we are than others. But we're all saved by the grace of God, and not of works, lest we should brag about it. So you can do good works, good deeds, Give your body to be burned. Give away everything you have. Join every church, club, and lodge in the country. Die and go to hell. You're not saved that way. You need to realize that. Number four is that you feel you're already righteous. 
A lot of self-righteous people feel that they're already righteous and they don't need to get saved. God said in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, But we're all as unclean things, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, There's none righteous, no, not one. But you'd be surprised to know the multitudes of self-righteous people in the land. They're depending upon their goodness, their righteousness, what they have done good, the life they have lived. They're self-righteous, not made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, not made righteous by the power of God, self-righteous. And you'd be surprised at the self-righteous people in the land today. If you begin to talk with them about their souls, they'll immediately say, well, I don't do bad. I haven't uh, killed anybody. I'm, I'm as good as old so-and-so over there, and he's a church member. I don't do this. I don't do that. And, and I'll take my chance, and I have my own ideas. And they depend upon their own self-righteousness to get to heaven. Jesus Christ said, if your righteousness don't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never go in. And they were the most righteous people that ever walked in shoe leather. And they didn't know God. So if you're self-righteous, depending on what you do and what you don't do to get you to heaven, you'll end up in hell as certain as you listen to my voice today. You don't get to heaven and get saved by your self-righteousness. That's multitudes of self-righteous people, religious Pharisees, that know nothing about God. Now you need to realize that. Number five, is it you feel you could have a better time of enjoyment as a sinner? Now the devil uses that one. Whenever you begin to speak to someone about his spiritual welfare, about getting saved, the devil whispers in his ear and says, Now listen, listen, if you get saved, you can't enjoy life. If you get saved, you can't enjoy the worldly things of this world. They are put here for you to enjoy, and you want to enjoy them. If you get saved, then you'll be sad the rest of your days, and you can't enjoy anything else in the world. That's a lie of the devil. The happiest people in the world today are saved people. They don't care anything about getting out here and watering in the mind, the muck of this world. They love God. No one lived any more worldly than I did before God saved me. I loved it. I mean, I loved the world. There was so much out there offered. I just loved it all. I could take it all in. And I really loved it. But when God saved me, I fell in love with the Lord and God's people and the things of God. And I fully enjoy the things of God far more than I enjoyed the world. And so when the devil comes to you and tells you that you can't enjoy life as a Christian, tell him what God said he was. God said the devil is a liar and the father of lies. And he's lying to you. There's more joy, more peace, more satisfaction in serving God and knowing God that you'll ever find out here in the world. Why are so many sinners today committing suicide? Why does 10,000 young people commit suicide every year? Why do you have a, a thousand, thousands of young people a day drinking the alcoholic beverages, teenagers on alcohol? Why? Because they're looking for something to satisfy, and that just don't satisfy. The only lasting peace and satisfaction must come from God. In Luke chapter 12, verses 19 and 20, the rich young ruler had worked hard all of his life, the young farmer or other, and he had uh, had a good crop and good barns and he was planning for the future. And he said, Now I will say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Now eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thy fool this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? Here is a young man who is going to enjoy what he had laid up. 
You have men today that's working to get fixed in life. They want to get everything squared away. They want a good bank account. They want the homes paid for. They want the automobiles, furniture paid for. They want to lay up a little nest egg. They want to get things squared away so they can enjoy life. God may say to you like he did the young farmer, Thy fool, you've worked hard all these days. You've laid up these treasures. You've neglected the most important thing in life. Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. That's happening to people all over the land today. I've known people that work real hard to get squared away, as they so call it, and then die. I was talking to a man one time that lived in this community. He owned property in this community. He was 65 years old. He said to me, Preacher Edwards, I have worked hard to get what I have. He said, now I have everything squared away. I have a good income. I have rental property. I have money in the bank. But he said, Preacher Edwards, I worked all of my life to get this, and now it's time for me to die. And it wasn't long till he died. Now you can work to try to get things squared away and then leave it all. You need to realize that you can enjoy what you have. And the Bible tells us that God gives you all good things to enjoy. And God wants you to enjoy the good things of this world. But you must enjoy it as a Christian if you're going to have peace and satisfaction in your heart. And, so, and you can. And if the devil tells you you can't enjoy life as a Christian, tell him what God said he was. He's a bald-faced liar. God said he was a liar, and he's a liar and the father of lies. And he, he'll tell you that. He told me that. The devil told me that many times. The devil said to me, he said, now, if you get saved, brother, you're wrecked for this world. You're wrong. You can't go out in the, to the dance floor and gamble on the pool table and play poker and and uh, run with that rowdy crowd. You can't do that. If you get saved. You know what You know what that means. You got to give that up. You must give it up. Well. He was a liar. God saved me. And I didn't give it up. It gave me up. God took care of that. And God gave me something much better. And God will give you something much better. If you come to know the Lord. Like a little child with a razor blade. If you have a little child. With a razor blade in his hands. And you start screaming at that child about that razor blade. It'll cut his little hand with that razor blade. But if you'll take a little stick of candy. And hold that stick of candy up. And that child see it. He knows what it is. He'll drop that razor blade and come get that candy. Now that's exactly what God does for sinners. God will save you and give you something better than you've ever had in this world. Number six. It is you feel you cannot live for God. Now the devil has, has won this one pretty well out of in days gone by but he still uses that the devil will tell you if you get saved that you can't live for God and he'll tell you the truth that's the truth but he doesn't tell you all of it he doesn't tell you that God will help you live for him I couldn't live for God in my own strength and power I just couldn't do it but through the help of God I can live for him and the devil said, now you better not try to get saved because you can't live it. You know you can't live it. Other people try to, and they can't live it, and that's the truth. But the trouble is they don't trust God. The Bible said, he that's within you is greater than the he that's in the world. God can help you live it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above your able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now God plainly said he will not allow you to be overpowered by temptation and the devil if you want an escape. I heard a preacher tell the other day where he visited this church, a little old lady sitting on the front pew and had on a black dress, a white collar, white sleeves, and a little handkerchief, and she was sitting there very pious-like, and evidently she'd had trouble with escaping temptation. And the preacher got up and gave the illustration like this. He said there was a building on fire. And there was a little rat in that building. And he saw the fire. He needed a way of escape. 
And then all of a sudden he spotted a little hole in the wall and said he scooted through that hole and escaped. That woman jumped up and said, praise God, praise God, I found the hole. Now she realized that God would always make a way of escape. He'll find the hole so he can get out of the burning building for you. God will not let you be overpowered by the devil if you want to find the hole so you can get out of the building. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, you don't keep yourself. Some people say, well, I would uh, get saved, but I just can't live it. And, and uh, I just, I, I'm afraid I, I can't hold out. And the Bible plainly said, you forget about the holding out. God said, let me hold you out. And that's a secret. God holding you, not you holding God. God holding you. There's a little boy one dark night walking through the woods. And he was holding his father's hand. And he became very much afraid. And he said, Daddy said, I, said you hold my hand. And then Daddy reached and grabbed his hand. And little fella ceased trembling. Why? Daddy was holding his hand. Now God will hold your hand. You don't have to hold out. God will hold you. God will see you through. God will see to it that you can endure and persevere right on to the end. Number seven, in that you feel you must prepare yourselves. Oh, how Satan has used this one. I've talked to people that said, preach Edwards, I'm going to get saved all right, but I got to get this straightened out and I got to uh, do this and, and untangle this and I, I got to correct this matter. I got to straighten these things out. And then, preacher, when I get all these things straightened out, then I'm coming to the Lord and get saved. You'll never get them straightened out. The more you try to straighten them out, the worse shape they get in. Like the man in the weave room. The boss weaver said, now if anything gets wrong with the shuttle and the threads, don't you try to straighten them out. You call the loom fixer. He'll take care of that. And this new fellow in there, he thought, well, uh, if something went wrong, I'll just straighten it out myself and got the whole thing all twisted up and messed up. And the, uh, the loom fix it took him for hours to straighten it out. And the superintendent came and said, didn't I tell you not to fool with those threads if they got tangled up? You know nothing about them, now you got them in a mess. That's going to take hours to straighten them out. And that's the way people do with their lives. They say, i got to straighten this out, and then they're going to wind themselves up in a bigger mess than ever before. What did Jesus say? He said, come just like you are. The old song says, come now just like you are. That's the way God wants you. You don't have to straighten a thing out. You just come to God and say, God, I'm in a mess. I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I'm undone. I deserve to go to hell. I should have been there a long time ago. I'm an old, wretched, cussed sinner. God, would you please have mercy on me and save me? God said, yes, I'll save you. And I'll straighten your life out. And I'll help you to straighten your life out. That's exactly what God will do. And you're going to have to prepare yourself. So many people have said, Preacher, I'm trying to get things now lined up. And if I can just get things prepared, then I'm coming and get saved, Preacher. But I've got to take care of these matters. They must be straightened. No, oh, no, no. That's a song of the devil. And he sings that quite often to people that procrastinate. Now we come to number eight. And that is, it is you feel you have plenty of time. A grave danger there. Oh, I was reading yesterday in the Reader's Digest. The Reader's Digest told about how many of our young people are hooked on alcohol in their early teens. Tens of thousands already drunkards in their early teens. You'd be surprised at how many young people are on whiskey today. Now, we talk about uh, dope. We talk about cocaine. We talk about stuff like that. But, brother, you need to check about this whiskey business, this beer and wine and liquor business. That's what you need to check on about your young people. There's so many young people that are already hitting the bottle. They're drinking alcohol and they're becoming drunkards. They'll fill a drunkard's grave in a devil's hell if they're not straightened out and delivered from it. You better beware of alcohol. Uh, you need to be aware of drugs, but you beware of alcohol because you ought to, if you get a hold of the Reader's Digest, this much Reader's Digest, read that article on young people drinking. It'll stir you to know how many in America are young people already drunks, already hooked on alcohol. Some started when they were just in their junior years, um, primary days, started drinking alcohol. 
Oh, beloved, the devil is a lie, and he'll start you off on beer, and that'll hook you, and you want something a little stronger, and you'll go on and drinking wine, and next thing you know, you're on hard liquor, and then maybe on dope. See, the devil starts you in that direction, maybe off on beer. You say, well, it's not so bad. Daddy puts it in the refrigerator. It must be all right. He drinks it, or maybe mama drinks it. Well, there's many of a young person, they become drunkards because their daddy drank beer and kept it in the refrigerator and kept it in the house. They thought it was all right, and so they drank it too. And dad will be held responsible when he faces God in the judgment. If the youngins die and go to hell as drunkards, God's going to hold him responsible too. You need to realize that. You say you have plenty of time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 2, Behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You don't have plenty of time. You don't have any promise of tomorrow. There's people who died today that thought they'd be alive tomorrow. You don't have any promise, any lease on life. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1, He that been often reproved, hard as an extra son, be destroyed in that without remedy. Many people today that are cut off suddenly are people, people that's hardened their necks. Read yesterday about this drunk up here, the side of Atlanta. Man had his license suspended some time ago, drunken driving, been a caught for drunken driving, got drunk, and uh, crossed over in front of another car and killed an innocent person. Oh, that's happening. You never know when these drunks are going to pull out in front of you and kill you on the highway. Just about everybody you meet today is either drinking beer, or liquor, or on some kind of dope, and you have to be very careful lest they pull out in front of you and kill you on the highway. Be a total abstainer. Don't drink a drop of it. Don't compromise with a devil. You young people stay clean and pure and don't drink it because it's wrong, it's weak, and it's sinful. Rich young farmer thought, well, he'd have his barns fixed and everything squared away. God said, you're a fool. You're not going to enjoy what you think you got here. You're going to die tonight. To die tonight. Your soul's going to be required of thee tonight. And you need to realize you have no promise of tomorrow. And you could be listening to this preacher today and be in hell tomorrow. You could be listening to me now and be in heaven tomorrow if you're a Christian. You need to get right with God. Several years ago, there's a dear businessman that always went off on, a, on his trips and gone many days and always come back home whenever he, he made his round. And he had three little girls. And it happened to be his birthday when he came in. They knew it was Daddy's birthday. And they wanted to surprise Daddy with a little something. And they fixed him up a nice little birthday card. The two oldest ones did. And and uh, drew up some things for him and fixed him up something beautiful and nice and kept watching for daddy to come and finally they saw daddy coming in the gate and they ran out to meet him the oldest little girl said daddy look what i have for you look look gave him the birthday cards and nice little things she'd fixed up and he hugged her real good the second little girl said daddy uh, look at mine and she had the little cards and and little gadgets fixed up for daddy it was his birthday but he looked down the little lane there and he saw the third little girl coming. She was dragging one foot. She had a limp arm by one side. She only had one good eye. Her mouth was drawn to one side. And she was limping along coming to meet Daddy. She had been deformed for a long time. And she had something in her little hand. Daddy ran to meet her and he picked her up and she could smile with that half-drawn mouth and looked up at her Daddy. And gave daddy what she had. She had some little dandelions that she'd picked and had them all twisted and stems up on one, flowers down on the other, clutched in that little old only good hand that she had. Looked up with that only little eye she could see with, with her mouth drawn to one side and hand them to her daddy with a half smile. Her daddy hugged and said, Honey, honey, I want you to know I appreciate your little flowers. More than all the other gifts, you're so sweet, you hugged and kissed her. You may feel like you're nothing and no good, but God loves you and God accepts what you do for him and you serve him because you're his. And you ought to appreciate the fact of serving God. Let's stand to our feet. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it, especially out in the radio listen audience. No doubt there's unsaved people out there that put up these same excuses I've mentioned, and you tell us we're without an excuse. Now, Father, I pray that your children will take these illustrations and these thoughts and use them 
in trying to reach others for thee. God help us to know you lovers, and we may feel like we're nothing, but we're precious in your sight. And what little we can do for you, we know you love us and appreciate us for it. And our God, I pray, help us to do even more as we sojourn. Have you in this invitation? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Debbie plays on the organ, I don't know why you stand before God, whether you're saved, backslidden, need a church home, or God is dealing with you about coming to this altar. But if God is dealing with you, you ought to come this morning. I'll preach the message that God laid on my heart. And I want the Lord to use it. I believe He will. In the audience, not in the radio listening audience. I, I want you to obey Him. That's all I'm asking you to do. That's all I can do is preach and give you a chance. Would you come if God is speaking? How about it? Are you in the will of God? Are you looking for a church home? Have you backslidden on the Lord? How about it?